Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of the American Civil War with Joe's Bang and Dang. Still rolling around on this old Overland campaign and the Atlantic campaign. That's pretty much all we got going on uh, the summer of 1864. But we do leave the whole entire United States for a second here. That's two uh, warships go at it and right up the coast of France. This American ship's been chasing the CSS Alabama for two years. Ridiculous. And why it's all the way in um, France, who knows? I guess we'll find France out. France was helping the Confederates out. Not uh, not publicly. Think so? Actually, was France up in the Union out? I don't think France was. Uh, it was one of the, uh, I think it was either Gettysburg or Gods and Generals. France maintained that it was officially neutral during the conflict. It was part of the country sympathized with the Confederacy. Yeah, most because of the need, same thing with England. Right. But after uh, Vicksburg and shit went down, they all were like, well. They were like, ooh. They were, on the, they were England and France were both on the verge of supporting publicly right uh confederacy right until that happened then they're like oh maybe not which is weird because uh england and france abolished slavery like years before yeah but i think the uh they still especially england still hated the union oh fuck yeah <clears throat> less than 100 years removed they're like motherfuckers the one that got away it's crazy that country is the youngest country there is well, not there is, but... Well, youngest world power there is, and fucking it's crazy. 200 something years old. Yeah. Anyways, uh, Battle of Sherborg, Jerusalem, Plank Road, and Cobes Farm coming up here. Oh, Plank Farm. Road again? Jerusalem Plank Road this oh. time. Last time it was... Was it a Plank Road? There's a Plank Road somewhere. Uh, something, there was some road, I don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe we mentioned it last episode. We did, yeah, because... The battle we did last episode leads into the Blinken Road. Blinken Road. Um, yeah, we got three battles. Cobb's Cobes Farm is the lengthiest one we got going on today. But before we do that, go check out our YouTube at Bang Dang Network. We are currently sitting at, as we sit here, sitting here at 467 subscribers. Come on, guys. We need Come on. 33 more Come for on. 500. Come on. And then, you never ever have to listen to the YouTube channel again. Well, you will, because then you need, uh, then we need 500 more for 1,000. Right. So. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, at Bang Dang Network over there, shorts, clips, full episodes, and our YouTube exclusive Dart League, Spotify, Apple. Give us a review, share us with your friends, and answer that Spotify question. And there's a poll question on uh, our most recent, the last episode of Civil War. So. Pull it up, baby. Pull it up. First up, we got the Battle of Sherborg, or sometimes called the Battle Off Sherborg, or the sinking of the CSS Alabama. It was a single ship action fought during the war, obviously. We already said it was in France. We've got the United States Navy warship USS Kearsarge uh, facing off against the CSS Alabama on June 19, 1864, off of Sherborg, France. After five successful commerce raiding missions in the Atlantic Ocean, CSS Alabama put into Sherborg Harbor on June 11, 1864. The Confederate States Sloop of War was commanded by Captain Raphael Semmes. I remember that guy. Formerly of the CSS Sumter. Mm. It was Captain Semmes' intention to dry dock his ship and receive repairs at the French port. Right. After 22 months of sailing, the Alabama boilers were burned out. I bet. The machinery needed repairs, loose at every joint, and her copper bottom was in rolls. I'm sure, dude. Oh, dude rough seas. Right. Oh, my. Goodness gracious. This thing was just going from, like country to country port to port wherever they could to get supplies all right wow the confederate navy vessel was crewed by 149 men armed with six 32 pounder cannons mounted broadside three guns per side two heavy pivot guns mounted on the center line and able to fire to either side nice. they had one eight inch 110 pound smoothbore gun one seven inch 68 pound rifled gun the Alabama had been pursued for two years by the screw sloop of war, USS Kearsarge. That is captained by John Winslow. All right, Winslow. Uh, Kearsarge was armed with two 11-inch smoothbore Dahlgren guns, which fired about 166 pounds of solid shot. Damn. Four 32-pound guns, one 30-pound parrot rifle. And she was crewed by around 163 sailors and officers. So outgunned. 
outgunned and outmanned. All right. Gear Sarge had, for, had a form of makeshift armor cladding, medium weight chain cable tristent tiers along her port and starboard midsections, basically acting as the equivalent of a chain mail for vulnerable sections of her hull where shot could potentially penetrate and hit her boilers or steam engine. This armor protection potentially gave the Union warship a definitive advantage over the Confederate raider. However, the Army was only capable of stopping shots from Alabama's lighter 32-pound balls. Oh. Either of her heavier guns could easily penetrate such lightweight protection. Really? Well, that's fantastic. In the event, it was a moot point, as Alabama only managed to score two hits in this area, both of which were well above the waterline, and vulnerable engineering areas, and would have been done little lasting damage, even if they had successfully penetrated the hull. 14th of June, Kearsarge finally caught up with the Alabama as she was receiving repairs. Kearsarge did not attack, as Alabama was in a neutral port. Instead, she waited, initiating a blockade of CSS Alabama and Cherbourg. Union Captain Winslow telegraphed USS St. Louis to request her assistance, but the fighting began before she could arrive. Damn, they had two of them following each other? Why not? Confederate Captain yeah, Semmings. I mean, America still got to go out and right. do shit. Confederate Captain Semmes used to use the time to drill his men for the coming battle. He's like, oh, imagine that, dude. No shit's about that. We know. We're, we're preparing this boat to get freaking ruined. <laughs> right. June 19th, Alabama, with nowhere else to go, ran up the stars and bars and exited the harbor to attack Kearsarge. They said, let's go, boys. She was escorted by the French Navy ironclad Caron, really, whose mission was to ensure that the ensuing battle occurred outside the French harbor. Right. Fantastic. Like, you better you do it, but you better not do it here. Like, All right, guys, out in the parking lot. All right, <laughs> take it outside. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Winslow spotted the departing Confederate raider, so he turned his ship around to take the impending battle out of French territorial waters. <sighs> Once out, Kearsarge turned about again, hoisted the United States Navy Jack, and lined up for a broadside. Captain Winslow ordered his gunners to hold their fire until the range closed. Alabama fired the first shots from the 100-pound pivot gun. They are not known to have hit. Eventually, the range closed to within a thousand yards, and Kearsarge fired her first shot. Oh shit! I bet you that uh, French ship was just sitting there watching this whole thing. They're like, yeah, that's what I was about to say. The whole fucking town was. <laughs> oh my! The two warships maneuvered on opposite courses throughout the battle. Kearsarge and Alabama made seven spiraling circles around each other, <sighs> moving southwest in a, in a three knot current, huh. which is uh, three and a half miles per hour. Both Captain Semmes and Captain Winslow attempted to cross each other's bow hoping to inflict heavy raking fire. Three of the Kearsarge 11-inch shells entered the Alabama's 8-inch gun. Port. Hey, oh. that's a pretty accurate-ass shot. You ain't kidding. The gun port. The Alabama gunpowder was damaged and defective. Her guns gave out a dull report with thick and heavy vapor while the Kearsarge battery was clear and sharp with powder burning like thin vapor. Nice. They got no smoke, and the other guys are just... Breathing in that shit. He can. Well, the battle continued in this manner for several minutes. In the meantime, on the French coast, hundreds watched the battle. Oh, shit. They're like, hell yeah. Kearsarge's armor cladding sustained two hits during the engagement. The first shell of 32 pounders struck the starboard gangway. <laughs> They're like, there really is a civil war. <laughs> right. They, they weren't lying. <laughs> uh, cutting, uh, hit the starboard gangway, cutting part of the chain armor and denting the wooden planking underneath. That's some. Heavy duty wood if it only dented it. All right. Second shot was again a 32 pounder that exploded and broke a link of the chain. Oh, shit. Both hits struck the chain five feet above the waterline and therefore did not threaten the boilers or the machine. Oh, ain't that nice? Right. Good for them. The gunnery of the Kearsarge was reportedly more accurate than that of the old rebels. I would assume. She fired slowly with well aimed shots while Alabama fired rapidly with poorly aimed shots. Alabama fired a total of over 370 rounds during the fighting. It is not known how many the Kearsarge fired. But it is known that she fired many fewer than the old rebels. Eventually, after just over an hour exchanging artillery fire, Alabama had received shot holes beneath the waterline. Uh -oh. Ooh. From the dog and guns of the uh, Kearsarge. And began to sink. Captain Simmons struck the Confederate colors, but still Kearsarge continued firing until a white flag was raised. Like, I don't care if you took your flag down. We want a white one up, baby. Right. One of the uh, rebel soldiers, with his hand, he raised a white flag. The battle was over. So Captain Semmes sent his remaining dinghy to Captain Winslow to ask for aid. <laughs> hey, bud. You want to do something now? Like, <laughs> come on. Uh, during the battle, 40 Confederate sailors were casualties. On, uh, 19 killed in action or drowned and oh. 21 wounded. Another 70 or so were picked up by the Kearsarge. 30 or so were rescued by Deerhound, which was a British yacht. 
<laughs> There's a rich British guy just watching the battle, uh, which Captain Winslow asked to help evacuate Alabama's crew. How many? 30? 30. So at least they weren't put into uh, right. and, prisoners. Well, they might have. I don't think the British would just hand them over, right? Well, this is just a yeah, They're not the Navy. Uh, and three French pilot boats oh. helped out as well. Oh, shit. Uh, Captain Semmes and 14 of his officers were among the sailors rescued by the Deerhound. Instead of delivering the captured nah. Confederates to Kearsarge, Deerhound set a course for Southampton. <laughs> Get the hell out of here. Thus enabling Captain Semmes' escape. No shit. This act angered the Kearsarge crew, who begged their captain to allow them to open fire on the British yacht. No. Captain Winslow would not allow this, so the Confederates got away and avoided imprisonment. You ain't kidding. Three men were wounded above the Kearsarge, one of whom died the following day. Aw, damn it. Right, you know they were pissed when that little yacht started sailing. Right. They were like, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> For many years after the battle, Confederate Captain Sammy stated that he would never have chosen to test Kearsarge had he known of her armor-clad protection. He just kept on running. Stay at the, uh, stay at the, right. the fuck, in France, fuck it. Right. Alabama had destroyed or captured dozens of Union merchant vessels during her Atlantic cruises. Well, good for them. And when word of Alabama sinking reached the northeastern United States, many northerners were joyful. But they were. Edouard Manet. Produced two paintings of the fight, the Battle of Kearsarge and the Alabama, now at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and also Kearsarge at Boulogne, now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. American Marine artist Xanthus Smith painted six versions of the naval battle, the most famous of these, a massive work exhibited at the 1876 Centennial Exposition. This is in the collection of the Union League of Philadelphia. 37th album of La Tunique's Blues titled Duel Dans La Manche, which means Duel in the Channel, takes place during the Battle of Cherbourg on the USS Kearsarge. Okay. Oh, shit. The battle was commemorated in the sea shanty. Roll, Alabama, roll. Uh-huh. Oh, roll tide, baby. Right. <laughs> November 8, 1984, the French minesweeper Cirquet located the wreck of the Alabama at a depth of 200 feet, a little under 6.2 miles north of the western approaches of Cherbourg Roads. Captain Max Garot, Garot, later confirmed that the wreck was that of the Alabama. Who is it still there? Oh, we'll find out, huh? 1988, a nonprofit organization named the CSS Alabama Association was created, and they was created to conduct a scientific survey of the wreck. Although it now lies in French territorial waters, the United States government claimed possession on the grounds that the location where Alabama had struck to Kearsarge had been within French territorial waters at the time of the battle. Had not been. Right, had not been. 3rd of October, 1989, France and the United States signed an agreement recognizing the wreck as a common historic heritage for both nations and established a joint scientific team for its exploration. Good oh, look guys. at you guys. March 31st, 23rd, 1995, the CSS Alabama Association and the Naval History and Heritage Command signed an agreement to accredit the Association for the Archaeological Survey of Alabama. 2002, over 300 samples were recovered, including the ship's bell, guns, part of the ship's structure, furniture, and tableware. All right. Nice. In 2004, a human jaw was found under a gun and was subsequently buried in Mobile, Alabama. Oh, my. Wow. So there's still guys down there, huh? Crazy. Well, that was that. That was kind of cool. Right. All right. Moving on. Battle of Jerusalem, good versus evil. <laughs> uh, the Battle of Jerusalem Plank Road, also known as the First Battle of Weldon Railroad. This took place uh, on uh, June 21st to the 23rd, uh, 1864, near Petersburg, Virginia. Yes, sir. This is the uh, the start of the Petersburg Siege, baby. Mm, well, this is the first series of battles during the Peter- Siege of Petersburg aimed at extending the Union siege lines to the west and cutting the rail lines supplied to Petersburg. Yes, sir. After the assaults on Petersburg the previous week failed to capture the city, Ulysses S. Grant reluctantly decided on a siege of Petersburg. He said, let's just chill. Right, that's what you're famous for, man. Right. Uh, this was defended by Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. The Union Army of the Potomac, commanded by Major General George Meade, entrenched east of the city, running from near the Jerusalem Plank Road, which is present-day United States Route 301, uh, crater Road to the Appomattox River. Oh, good for you guys. Look at that. Right to the river. Oh, Grant's first objective was to s- nope. was, was to s- check his text. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Grant's first objective was to secure the three remaining open rail lines that served Petersburg and the Confederate capital of Richmond, which were the Richmond and Petersburg Railroad, the South Side Railroad, which reached to Lynchburg in the west, and the Petersburg Railroad, also called the Petersburg and Weldon Railroad, which led to Weldon, North Carolina. 
and connected to the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad, which led to the Confederacy's only remaining major point, which, or port, which was in Wilmington, North Carolina. Damn. Damn, dude, shut off that, then you're done, bro. Grant decided on a wide-ranging cavalry raid, the Wilson-Cotts raid, they called it, against the South Side and then Weldon Railroads as well. But he also directed that a significant infantry force be sent against the Weldon closer to his current position. General Meade selected the Second Corps, temporarily commanded by Major General David Burney, while Major General Wilf- Winfield Hancock was suffering from his lingering wound incurred at Gettysburg. Yeah, it was a lingerer. And the Sixth Corps, also commanded by Major General Horatio Wright. The positions in the trench lines occupied these two corps were to be filled in by units of the Army of the James. That would be removed from Bermuda 100. Mm-hmm. As the troops were rearranging the lines June 21st in preparation for the mission against the railroad, they received a surprise visitor, old Honest Abraham Lincoln himself, who traveled by water and landed at City Point, Grant's newly established headquarters. He told Grant, I just thought I would jump aboard a boat and come down and see you. Oh. I don't expect I can do any good, and in fact, I'm afraid I may do some harm. Oh. But I'll just put myself under your orders, and if you find me doing anything wrong, just send me right away. No shit. After discussing strategy with Jant, Jant, <laughs> with Grant, Lincoln visited some of the Sixth Corps troops who would participate in the upcoming battle. He's like, I'm proud of you guys. Go win one for the Gipper. All right. Look at this guy. Got right him. All right. He's about to die yeah, shortly. John, yes. Well, a couple months. Right. Um, Jefferson Davis never. Only time he came is to uh, talk shit to the generals. <laughs> right. <laughs> Piece of shit. Right. 21st of June, 1864, elements of the Second Corps probed toward the railroad and skirmish old rebel cavalry. Got some skirmishing going on with the old ribs. The plan of attack was that both the Second and the Sixth Corps would cross the Jerusalem Plank Road and then pivot northwest about two miles to reach the railroad. Difficult terrain, swamps and thickets slowed their advance, and by the morning of the 22nd of June, a gap opened up between the two corps. Uh Uh-oh. While the 2nd Corps began pivoting as planned, the 6th Corps encountered rebel troops from Major General Camdus Wilcox's division of Lieutenant General A.P. Hill's Corps, and they began to entrench rather than advance. Ooh. They're like, "Uh uh-uh, we're just going to chill here, boys. Brigadier General William Mahoney, another division commander in Hill's Corps, observed that the gap between the two Union Corps were, 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 was widening and creating a prime target. Yeah, He's like, can't be doing oh, that, guys. And I, no, uh, the second Corps, I don't even know. Idiots. Well, Mahone had been a railroad engineer before the war and had personally surveyed this area of South Petersburg, so he was familiar with a ravine that could be used to hide the approach of a Confederate attack column. Look at that guy. Right. Robert E. Lee approved Mahone's plan at 3 p.m. and on June 22nd, Mahone's men in emerged in the rear of the 2nd Corps Division of Brigadier General Francis Barlow, catching them by surprise. Well, a soldier wrote, the attack was to the Union troops more than a surprise. It was an astonishment. No. Another soldier, which was from the diary of W. Gordon McCabe, artilleryman in Mahone's division, wrote, with a wild yell which rang out shrill and fierce through the gloomy pines, Mahone's men burst upon the flank, a peeling volley which roared along the whole front. A steam, uh, a steam, a stream of waste and fire under which the adverse left fell as one man, yeah. and the bronze veteran swept forward, shriveling up Barlow's division as lightning shrivels the dead leaves of autumn. Oh, my. Damn, these guys know. What is this guy? All right. What, this uh, guy, a scholar? All right. It's fantastic. Well, war does make you... Be a poet. Right. <laughs> Didn't even know it. <laughs> Barlow's division quickly collapsed under the surprise assault. The division of Brigadier General John Gibbon which had erected earthworks, was also surprised by an attack from the rear, and many of the regiments ran for safety. Hmm. Mahone sent an urgent message to Wilcox, asking him to join in the attack. <laughs> but, he said, won't you join me? But Wilcox was consoling about the Sixth Corps' men uh, to his front, and the two regiments he sent in support arrived way too late to make a difference anyway. The Second Corps troops rallied around earthworks they had constructed on the night of the 21st of June and stabilized their lines. Darkness ended the fight. In- mm, poor guys. June 23rd, Second Corps advanced to retake its lost ground, but the Confederates had pulled back, abandoning the earthworks that they had captured. Right. Under orders from General Meade, the Sixth Corps set out a heavy skirmish line after 10 a.m. and a second attempt to reach the Weldon Railroad. Men from Brigadier General Lewis A. Grant's 1st Mar- Vermont Brigade. Any relation? Mm had begun tearing up track when they were attacked by a larger force of Confederate infantry. Numerous Vermonters were taken prisoner, and only about a half mile of track had been destroyed when they were chased away. 
General Meade repeatedly urged Horatio Wright to move forward and engage the enemy, but Wright refused to move, consoling that his troops would suffer the same reverses as the Second Corps. How are you going to just day. ignore your general, dude? Right. 7.35 p.m., Meade gave up and told Wright, your delay has been fatal. You piece of shit. Meade's aide, Theodore Lyman, he wrote this. On this particular occasion, Wright showed himself totally unfit to command a corps. Yeah, he's gone by Union casualties were 2,962. Oh, my god! Confederates were 572. Wow. The battle was inconclusive with advantages <laughs> gained on both sides. Right. Confederates were able to retain control of the Petersburg Railroad. Federals were able to destroy a short segment of the railroad before being driven off. But more importantly, the siege lines were stretched a little further to the west. <laughs> Our strategy grant would continue until the spring of 1865. He's like, right. every day, all we need to do is a quarter of a, a mile. Bit. All we a need to just, just nudge over. Right, a little bit. Uh, other segments of the Petersburg Railroad were destroyed by the Wilson Colts raid, and more would fall to the Union Army during the Battle of Globe Tavern, oh, or which is the second Battle of Weldon Railroad in August. Although Lee could ship supplies by wagon from the Weldon where it reached Stony Creek Station. Mm-hmm. I mean, th- wagons th- aren't going to hold you very no. much when you got. Uh, compared to a train. <clears throat> right. In an expedition, December 7th through the 11th, Major General Gubanua Warren destroyed an additional 16 miles of track, rendering the Weldon Railroad unable to supply Peters. Oh, shit. Nice, dude. Man, that's in December, so we'll probably have that. We will. Goodness gracious. Wow, what a surprise for the old Union. Got an attack on them. They're doing some shit, though. That's all they need to do. Right. Grant's Oop. got you right where he wants you. He getting. The Battle of Gold Farm saw a Confederate Corps under Lieutenant General John B. Hood attack parts of two Union Corps under Major Generals Joseph Hooker and John Schofield. 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 <laughs> this action was part of the Atlanta campaign. The Atlanta campaign. Ulysses S. Grant ordered Sherman to move against Johnston's army, break it up, and to get it into the interior of the enemy's country as far as you can. Inflicting all the damage you can against their war resources, nice. and also find all the liquor you all can. All the barrels of whiskey, and baby. bring it back to me, baby. baby. What? What about the beer? No. <laughs> <laughs> Give it to the slaves. Right. I mean, freedmen. <laughs> right. Sherman commanded elements of three armies. Army of the Cumberland under Major General George Thomas was made up of the Fourth Corps, led by Major General Oliver Otis Howard. The Fourteenth Corps under Major General John Palmer. 20th Corps, commanded by Major General Joseph Hooker, and three cavalry divisions led by Brigadier Generals Edward McCook, Kennard Garrard, and Hugh Judson Kilpatrick. Army of the Tennessee, meanwhile, was led by Major General James McPherson, which included the 15th Corps under Major General John Logan, left wing of the 16th Corps under Major General Greenville Grenville Dodge, and the 17th Corps under Major General Francis Preston Blair Jr. Wow, rich guy. The Army of the Ohio was commanded by Major General John Schofield, which consisted of the 13th Corps under Schofield and a cavalry division commanded by Major General George Stoneman. Sherman began his campaign with almost 100,000 men. 100,000. Is this army bigger than the Potomac? Mm, just a little bit smaller. Smaller, uh, which included Thomas's 60,000 and 130 guns, McPherson's 25,000 and 96 guns, and Schofield's 14,000 and 28 guns. Hmm. Through the fighting near Dallas, Sherman lost 12,000 casualties, but was reinforced by the fresh 17th Corps at that time. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, very good, dude. Right. Very good. Well, uh, General Johnston's Army of Tennessee began the campaign with two infantry corps, led by Lieutenant Generals William Hardy and John Bell Hood. Oh, JBH. A cavalry corps under Major General Joseph Wheeler. The army was soon reinforced from the Army of Mississippi by the corps of Lieutenant General Leonidas Polk. Leonidas? Yep. Oh, and the cavalry division under Brigadier General William Hicks Jackson. I thought Leonidas Polk died. Or who's, right. What was Polk died? Polk was killed at Pine Mountain on 14th of June and and was temporarily, temporarily he just died a couple, a couple, a couple days ago. Reinforced by the army and by the Corps of Lieutenant General. I mean, still, it's his people, I guess. That's, right. That's what they're saying. Yeah. But. Polk was murdered at Pine Mountain on 14th of June, which we had that episode, and temporarily replaced by Major General William Wing Loring. Hardy's Corps com- included the divisions of Major Generals William Bate, Benjamin Cheatham, Patrick Claiborne, and William Walker. Hood's Corps comprised the divisions of Major Generals Thomas Hinman, Carter Stevenson, Alexander Stewart. 
Polk's Corps was made up of the divisions of Major General Edward Walthall and Samuel Gibbs French, and also Brigadier General Winfield Featherston. As recently as the Battle of Cassville on May 19th, the Confederate Army had numbered 70 to 74,000 troops. Since then, Johnston's army sustained about 3,000 casualties in the fight in near Compared Dallas, to, Georgia. Uh, Sherman's 12,000. Pitiful. Mm. The Atlanta campaign, which we know began May 7th, 1864, when Sherman uh, began to advance. Sherman sent McPherson's army on a wide swing to the west, while the armies under Thomas and Schofield pressed Johnston's defense frontally. After the battle, uh, battle, after the battle of Rocky Face Ridge, Johnson withdrew from the Dalton position. <laughs> the Battle of Resaca occurred May 13th to the 16th, after which Johnson retreated again. After a skirmish at Adairsville, Johnson tried to set a trap for Sherman's forces, which were advancing on a broad front. Oh. At the Battle of Cassville, May 19th, Johnson's attempted counterstroke miscarried, and the Confederate Army withdrew the next day. Ooh, Didn't even know he miscarried. He looked in the toilet, and there was something there. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Since the old Reb defenses at Alatoona Pass were too strong, Sherman tried to turn Johnson's position by a wide sweep to the west. This resulted in a series of actions in late May, known as the Battles of New Hope Church, Pickett's Mill, and Dallas, which we had all of those. And that's Dallas, Georgia, guys, not Texas. Right. The Union forces then shifted to the east, finally forced Johnston to order another retreat. What is he, um, McClellan? Jeez. Right, right. Mid-June, a series of actions took place near Gilgal Church in Pine Mountain, after which Johnston fell back to Kennesaw Mountain. Well, Kennesaw Mountain represented the key to the Confederate defenses. No. The railroad coming from the north veered to the northeast past Kennesaw's northern end, then turned south before reaching Marietta. No, right. The mountain Ridge runs northeast to southwest, which uh, with three notable features. These are Big Kennesaw, which stands 691 feet above the surrounding terrain at the northeast end. Little Kennesaw, about 400 feet. And Pigeon Hill was about 200 feet. Uh, and they were at the southwest end. The Pigeon Hill was, at least. From Big Kennesaw's dominating summit, any daytime movements by the Union forces could be immediately observed. Kennesaw Mountain was probably a stronger position than Rocky Face Ridge and Alatoona Pass. Well, yeah, you're on the top of a fucking 900-foot out or 700-foot mountain. Right. Oh, my. Confederate defenses. Oh, no. Hood's Corps held the old rebel right flank east of Kennesaw Mountain in North Marietta. Loring's Corps held the mountain in the center, with Featherston's division on the right, Walt Hall's division in the center, and French's division on the left. Hardy's Corps had the left flank, with the divisions of Walker, Bate, Claiborne, and Cheatham deployed from right to left. Hardy's troops were posted behind Noose's Creek. Noses Creek, sorry. Hardy's troops were posted behind Noses Creek which was swollen from the rest, recent heavy rains. In front of the Confederate defenses was a fortified outpost line. The old rebel infantry d defended a seven-mile-long front. Damn. Wheeler's cavalry guarded the right flank, while Jackson's cavalry watched the left. Man. Yeah, so, they, yeah, anybody coming down, they just mow down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Morning, June 19th, Sherman optimistically believed the Confederates had withdrawn the Chattahoochee River, but by day's end, he realized that assessment was wrong. McPherson's three corps formed the Federal left wing with Blair's corps on the extreme left. Thomas's army advanced with Palmer's Corps on the left, Howard's Corps in the center, and Hooker's Corps on the right. On the Union right wing, Schofield's Corps marched southeast along the Sandtown Road. There was a vigorous cavalry clash on the left between Garage Division and Wheeler oh. at, at this time as well. Oh, that's fantastic. Look at that. Hooker was able to cross the Noses Creek at a place where the stream curved to the west and established his corps on the right side of the creek. Schof or the east side. Right. Schofield reached the place where the road from Powder Springs Church to Marietta spanned Noses Creek. But he did not even attempt to cross. Federal cannons took Pigeon Hill under fire, inflicting 35 casualties on French's Missouri Brigade. Oh, shit. Including his commander, Brigadier General Francis Cockrell. Oh, bye-bye, Cockrell. French responded by having his gun crews drag their cannons up Pigeon Hill. <laughs> They're uh -oh. like, really? <laughs> On June 20th, Sherman began extending his right wing towards the south. Howard ordered Brigadier General Thomas Wood's division and a brigade from Major General David Stanley's division to replace the left flank at Hooker's Corps. Brigadier General Alpheus Williams' division on Hooker's left shifted to the right flank of the Corps. Later, Stanley's other brigades were able to cross to the west bank of the Noses Creek. They seized two hills and were counterattacked by Confederates who recaptured one of them. Stanley's division suffered 250 casualties. Since it rained again that day, Sherman decided not to try any attacks until the weather cleared. Brigadier General Jacob Dolson Cox's division of Schofield's Corps made a successful crossing of Noses Creek and entrenched on the old east side. The constant rain caused many sick soldiers in both Union and Rebel armies to be evacuated to the rear. Yep. 
Get out of here. You're worthless. You're worthless. Busted. June June 21st, Sherman's Army continued shifting to its right. McPherson's Army of the Tennessee relieved part of Thomas's Army of the Cumberland. Palmer's Corps replaced Brigadier General John Newton's division of Howard's Corps. In turn, Newton's division took over the left flank of Hooker's Corps, right. allowing, it, it, allowing it to extend to the right. Howard's Corps retook the hill previously captured by the Confederates and seized ground, which enabled it to advance several hundred yards. Hooker's Corps pushed forward at the same time, occupying some hills near Cobes Farm, also known as Culp's Farm, uh, while maintaining contact with Howard's Corps on its left. Look at that, dude. It's got a plan here, Sherman. Right. Brigadier General Milo Haskell's division of Schofield's Corps crossed the Nose Creek, made contact with the right flank of Hooker's Corps. Stoneman's horsemen clashed with Jackson's division on Schofield's right, right flank. Johnson's noted, uh, Johnston noted Sherman's extension of his right wing. And dec- I would hope so. And decided that Hardy's lines had been stretched almost to the limits. He's like, ooh, we can't stretch him anymore. Therefore, he decided to counter it by moving Hood's corps from his right to his left flank. To fill the gap, Johnston ordered Loring to extend his corps to his right and instructed Wheeler to dismount his cavalrymen to man Hood's trench. Johnson knew that McPherson might attack his weakened right flank, but all Sherman's recent moves were by the Union right flank. Johnson decided to accept the risk because he felt that his only other alternative was to retreat. I see he said, I've done enough of that. Right. Morning of June 21st, Schofield believed that the way to Marietta was unguarded. However, by the evening, Schofield suspected that he was facing substantial opposition. In fact, Hood's Corps left its original position in the morning and clamped, clamped, <laughs> <laughs> clamped down, <laughs> and camped on the Powder Springs Road west of Marietta in the evening. See? Mm-hmm. Look at that shit. June 22nd dawned with clear skies. Uh-oh, time to fight, boys. Sherman decided to make a major effort to force Johnston to retreat. He ordered Thomas to direct Hooker to move his corps east toward Marietta. Sherman instructed Schofield to advance along Powder Springs Marietta Road before Lincoln with Hooker's right flank and to guard the Cheney House where the Sandtown Road met with the Powder Springs Road. Early in the afternoon, Hooker advanced with Major General Daniel Butterfield's division on the left Brigadier General John Geary in the center, and Williams on the right. Very, very soon, Hooker skirmishers reported that the old rebels were ahead and forming an attack. All right. This information prompted Hooker to order his quarter and trench on a line from Howard's right flank to Cobes Farm on the Powder Springs Marietta Road. South of the road facing east, Colonel Silas Strickland's brigade of Haskell's 23rd Corps also fortified its position. The rest of Haskell's brigades were to Strickland's right and facing southeast. Farther south was Cox's division guarding the area near the Cheney House. That's what I like about you, Cox. You're quick on your feet. <laughs> In the Atlanta campaign to date, Hooker's 20th Corps suffered 5,000 casualties. Terrible. More than any of Sherman's formations after starting with 20,000 men. Dude, that's 25% of his freaking people. Uh, great, great. Williams' division was deployed with the brigades of Brigadier Generals Thomas Ruger and Joseph uh, Knipe on the right and the center. Kniper, no Knipen. Right. And Colonel James S. Robinson's brigade on the very left. Williams sent one the 123rd New York Infantry Regiment forward into the woods on a reconnaissance, while Haskell ordered the 14th Kentucky Infantry on the same mission. All right, well, both units pressed forward to positions where they saw large numbers of rebels massing for an attack, and they reported this information. <laughs> Hooker twice asked Thomas to reinforce his corps, claiming the whole rebel army was in front of him. This prompted Thomas to personally look over the situation. He concluded that the threat was exaggerated and that Hooker's line was sufficiently strong to defend itself. Like, ah, you're good, bud. He's like, come on, guy. Right. On Geary's right, there was a hill surrounded by open fields. This was entrenched and crowned with artillery. Nice. Small marshy streams ran between Williams' brigades and in the interval between Gary and Williams. Oh, that's cool. All right. Well, that got some good ground here. Huh? All right. Haskell's division consisted of brigades of Colonels John McQuiston, William Hobson, and Strickland. <laughs> Strickland! <laughs> Schofield was with Haskell when the 14th Kentucky's report came in. Ordered, he ordered Cox to leave one brigade at Cheney House and march to Haskell's support. Leaving Colonel James Riley's brigade, uh, Cox marched with three others. But the action was over before they even went very far. Mm, whatever. They were then placed to the right of Haskell's brigades. Cox's brigades were led by Colonels Daniel Cameron, Richard Barter, Robert Beard, and Riley. Bird. During the early afternoon, June 22nd, Hood's Corps moved along the Powder Springs Road until it was a half a mile west of Mount Zion Church. Hood then deployed his corps with Stevenson's division athwart the road, Hinman's division to its right, Stewart's division directly behind Stevenson. Hood ordered his division commanders to drive the Federals toward Manning's Mill, which was two miles west of Cobes Farm. Hood sent a message to Johnson, message, message, Hood sent a message to Johnson claiming uh, incorrectly that he defeated a Union attack and that he was counterattacking. Hood's daily report was unclear about what happened that day. 
His memoirs never referred to the Cole Farms actions. <laughs> I wonder why. And other rebel sources were silent. Mm. Therefore, Hood's motives that day can only be inferred. Apparently, he believed that the old Federales were advancing in March column and that his troops were executing a powerful flank attack against an unready opponent. The old rebel assault began at short time, a short time after 5 p.m. Well, Stevenson arranged his division with the brigades of Brigadier Generals Alfred Cumming and Edmund Pettus on the left, would come in in the front. <laughs> on the right were the brigades of Brigadier Generals John Brown and Alexander Reynolds on the right, with Brown in front. Cummings' brigade, consisted largely of former Georgia militia, advanced through dense foliage until they received a volley from the 14th Kentucky at a range of 30 feet. Well, Cummings' troops retreated in confusion, rallied, attacked again, and were repulsed a second time. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Outflanked when the 123rd New York was driven back, the 14th Kentucky fell back to a second position and requested and continued to resist. I don't know how you got requested. <laughs> right. <any of> that. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, Haskell peremptory ordered the 14th Kentucky to withdraw to the main line. Its commander, Colonel George Gallup, later claimed that 69 dead rebels nice. were found in front of his regiment's position. <laughs> when the old rebs attacked Strickland's defenses, they were driven off by rifle power. Rifle fire. <laughs> they were they were driven off by rifle fire. <laughs> they were driven off. They were driven off by rifle fire. And <laughs> if you didn't try to pronounce it, if you pronounce the word right, you wouldn't right. fucking up. They were driven off by rifle fire and by canister shot from Shields' 19th Ohio battery and Paddock's battery F of the First Michigan. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's PM Michigan. North of the road, Browns's and Reynolds's troops quickly drove back to 123rd New York and advanced into clear fields in front of the brigades of Ruger and Knight. All right. When the Confederates emerged, they were pounded by the 13th New York battery from Gary's Hill. These guns were joined by the three-inch ordnance rifles of the Winnegar's Battery 1, 1st oh. New York, and the 12-pounder Napoleons of Woodbury's Battery M, 1st New York, from Williams's division. Stevenson soldiers were briefly able to penetrate a hollow... <laughs> They were briefly able to penetrate a hollow between Williams and Gary, but were soon compelled to recoil under the combined heavy artillery rifle fire oh, <laughs> and rifle fire. Right. right. Crazy. During the attack, Hooker asked for Howard to release Butterfield's division, but it could not be moved immediately. Instead, Howard sent a few reserve regiments to Hooker's aid. Later that night, Howard finally released Butterfield's division. Oh, cool. While most of the Stevenson's men fell back to the woods... Some soldiers took cover in a ravine. It soon proved to be a death of trap course. when it became the target of one of Williams's batteries. Oh, no. So just sitting there. Right. Now, Hinman's division stormed out of the woods after Stevenson's men began to retreat. Division moved towards Robinson's brigade and Gary's right flank. Uh oh. Hinman's left flank was composed of the brigades of Brigadier General Zachariah Deus hmm. and William Tucker. Oh, fantastic. These formations halted as soon as they came under artillery fire and fled in confusion. Oh, really? Hinman's right flank consisted of the brigades Brigadier Generals Edward Walthall and Arthur Middleton Manigal. Okay. Walthall's men went to ground as soon as they came under fire. Man Manigault's troops faced a patch of marshy ground in the area that complicated their advance. After trying and failing to cross a boggy creek under heavy fire. Boggy. Right? <laughs> boggy. <laughs> boggy creek. <laughs> under heavy fire, the soldiers either fled or took cover. According to Williams' account, Hinman's division was repulsed by artillery alone. I'm sure it was. Williams's, Williams's infantry having taken no part in the fighting in that area. Good for them, snacking. Right. Uh, Johnson admitted losing 1,000 troops in the battle. Jeez. Wow. Williams reported sustaining 130, while Haskell's loss was about the same. Wow. Gary's losses were trifling. <gasps> you trifling, trifling ass hoe. <laughs> trifling ass bitch. Uh, what the hell? I looked it up. It means, like, insignificant. Not serious. That's what it means. Uh, historian Robert Castle estimated that Hood's attack cost his corps 1,500 killed, wounded, and missing, two-thirds of which were from Stevenson's division. He also calculated that total Union casualties were 250, of which 86 from Knipe's brigade, 72 from Strickland's. 123rd New York lost 48 casualties, while the 14th Kentucky lost 12, killed, and 48 wounded. Castle called the action more a one-sided slaughter than a battle. Finally, the Union's on the good side of that, huh? The above losses were echoed by an article by Scott Wilbur for the National Park Service. Wilbur also stated the Union forces engaged in the action outnumbered Hood 14,000 to 11,000. Okay. Do you imagine? So 14,000 of those guys, and there's another 80,000 just chilling, doing nothing. Ridiculous. Sherman told Schofield that, I will probably meet you today at Mrs. Kolb's. 
Nevertheless, Sherman spent the day with the Corps of Coward and Palmer. Isn't that like a law firm? <laughs> At 5.30 p.m., Hooker received a message from Sherman asking, How are you getting along? Near what house are you? Sherman had heard some cannon fire, but it did not seem like anything serious. Sherman returned to his headquarters at Big Shanty that very evening. Hooker immediately replied, but his message was unaccountably delayed. Huh. 9.30 p.m., Sherman finally received Hooker's note, which read as follows. We have repulsed two heavy attacks and feel confident, our only apprehension being our extreme right flank. Three entire corps are in front of us. Uh, Sherman, w- <laughs> Sherman wondered why Hooker was anxious about his right flank since Schofield's corps was supposed to be there. He did not understand how he could have missed the sound of two heavy attacks. 9.30 p.m., Sherman issued a reply to Hooker. Right. Dispatch received, it says. Schofield was ordered this morning to be on the Powder Springs and Marietta Road in close support of your right. Is this not the case? There cannot be three corps in your front. Johnson has but three corps, and I know from personal expression that a full proportion is now and has been all day on his right and center. Oh, wow. He's like, what the fuck's going on? Right. Like, what, what are you guys doing, dude? <sighs> Sherman sent Thomas a message asking him to make sure that Schofield was on Hooker's right. Thomas sent two replies saying that the situation on the right flank was under control. And he suggested that only weak Confederate forces must be in front of McPherson. Finally, Sherman received a message from Schofield reporting that Hood's Corps attacked his and Hooker's positions at Cold Farm and was defeated. According to Sherman's memoirs, written 10 years after the war, he rode to the right flank on the morning of the 23rd of June, 1864, to meet with Schofield and Hooker. When he presented Hooker's message, Schofield became angry saying his troops were in the proper position on their right. Sherman wrote that he chided Hooker for claiming three corps were in front of him. Oh, shit. He's like, this motherfucker. Uh, Castle asserted that the account in Sherman's memoirs was the product of faulty memory and personal (gasps) animosity toward Hooker. Oh, no. Schofield later denied being angry with Hooker and suggested that Sherman must have misunderstood Hooker's message. Hmm. (laughs) In fact, Hooker's report to Thomas at midnight, he credited Haskell for helping to repulse Hood's assault. Right. Schofield wrote that he did not recall meeting with Sherman in the morning, and perhaps the commanding general met with Haskell instead. Okay, Sherman, you're losing it, bud. Right. What? What's going on? Hooker's claim that he faced three corps was absurd, but there was an element of truth to it. While Hood's corps was in front of Hooker and Schofield, part of Hardy's corps opposed Butterfield's division, and one of the Confederate cavalry brigades in the area originally belonged to the Army Mississippi, that is, Loring's corps. In this very case... Once the action began, Hooker performed superbly as a combat leader. Well, good for you, Hooker. Hooker had already resented Sherman's obvious favoritism towards McPherson's Army of the Tennessee. Yeah, they haven't liked each other for yeah. a long time. Uh, he also believed Sherman mishandled his corps at the Battle of the New Hope Church. He did. he did. The Cobes Farm incident led to a steady decline in Hooker's standing with Sherman. Oh, man. When McPherson was killed, spoiler alert, July 22nd, coming oh, up soon. McPherson's killed? <laughs> Right. <laughs> Hooker expected to be promoted to command of the Army of the Tennessee <laughs> since he was senior in rank. Uh, doubting that Hooker would prove to, prove to be a cooperative, loyal subordinate, Sherman passed over him and selected Howard to replace McPherson instead. Some mafia shit happened. In he ain't kidding. Uh, Hooker found this especially insulting because he blamed Howard for his defeat at the Battle of Chancellorsville. <laughs> Jeez, we're just all... Oh. Why are these guys even together? Right. Uh, Hooker promptly tendered his resignation, and which Sherman accepted. Glad he said, bye. Accepted. I don't he's care. Like, We're the fuck out of here. No. Even though he's probably the best guy that you got. Right. By the next day, Hood's corps entrenched itself, and it was clear that assaulting it would be foolish. Foolish. Sherman instructed Schofield to find it, uh, whether the old rebel left flank could be turned. Afternoon of June 23rd, 1864, Riley's brigade moved south along the Sandtown Road to where it crossed Ollie's Creek. Riley found dismounted and barricaded soldiers from Brigadier General Lawrence Sullivan Ross's cavalry uh, defending the crossing. Schofield reported to Sherman that his corps was extended too far. Clearly, Schofield was not able to outflank the rebels unless Thomas's army shifted to its right. Clearly. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas reported that his army was already extended too much. Furthermore, mm. Sherman received a report that McCook's cavalrymen were unable to damage the railroad line supplying Johnson's army because they were unable to cross the Chattahoochee River. Oh. A frustrated Sherman sent a telegram to Union Army Chief of Staff Major General Henny Halleck. He's going to the big guy. No. Oh, fuck everybody else. He says, the whole country is one vast fort. As fast as we gain one position, the enemy has another already. Right. We can't do it. You will do it. You will do it. Sherman faced three choices. Use McPherson to hit Johnston's right flank. Wear down the Confederate trenches by artillery barrages and short infantry advances. Or, or make a frontal assault. 
even though Blair reported that the trenches in front of him were held by cavalry. Ooh. Sherman, he rejected the first choice. He did not He did what, not want to saying, use McPherson to hit Johnson's right. Are they right. saying that um, the cavalry are the weaker guys that, to defend trenches or something? Oh, wow. I think Blair saying this is a good thing to do. All right. He was so fearful that Johnston might strike his vital railroad supply line near Big Shanty that Sherman wanted McPherson to strongly guard that area. That makes sense. Right. He also rejected the second choice. One of his strategic missions was to prevent Johnson from reinforcing uh, Robert E. Lee's army so Sherman could not allow a stalemate to develop. No. Nope. Therefore, Sherman resolved to adopt the third choice to make a frontal front attack. attack. Let's just do it, guys. Let's just in, do it. We're going in missionary, boys. <laughs> Let's just do it. Uh, he reasoned that he outnumbered Johnson, yet the Confederate trench lines were longer than his own. All right. Therefore, they must be weak somewhere. All right. Right, I mean, got a point I had, there. I had to. This resulted in the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain coming up uh, probably next week, June 27th, in which the Union attacks were repulsed with heavy casualties. Well, you ain't Spoiler gay. alert. Well, when you're trying to get up a hill. Well, and you're attacking entrenched people. Right. Much of the battlefield landscapes has been altered and fragmented. Of course it has. Some essential features remain, though. Oh. Including the Cobe Farmhouse and okay. Family Cemetery. All right. Well, creepy. <laughs> War- Ward Creek is still there. And the heights used by the Federal 20th and 23rd Corps in their repulse of the old rebel assault. These resources are protected within the Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield Park. Residential subdivisions have hemmed in the park and overwhelmed the battlefield landscape beyond the park boundary. You bastards. Including the heights from which the old rebels began their assault. You sons of bitches. Well, it's just the landscape. And they're not clearing it like lazies. What does this uh, Cobb Farm, Cobb Farmhouse look like? Do you think it's shitty or did they restore it? I bet it's a nice little house. <laughs> right. right. Look at that shit. It's not bad. Beautiful. <laughs> it is, really. It's oh. beautiful. A little yard. Why is it fenced in? Talk about it. It's great. It's decent. I'd live there. Decent. Two fireplaces. On the same side of the house for some reason. One's probably in the bedroom and one's probably in the living room. Avi. And with that, that's how we finish up today's episode, Cherbourg, Jerusalem, Plank Road, Cobes Farm, which, if I'm not mistaken, we had two Union victories and an inclusive one, so the Union, uh, but it's all right because they're about to go on a little uh, losing streak here right. at the aforementioned uh, Kennesaw Mountain, um, and then we got some Overland stuff, Battle of St. Mary's Church, Battle of Staunton River Bridge. And the Battle of Saponi Church, probably we'll have all four of those. Bang Dang Network on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, share with your friends, answer that Spotify question, and we shall be back next week for more Battles of the American Civil War. Where are the mother music going to be? Bang Dang.